Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Ethics and Morality, and it is part of the Human Soul series. It was presented in Melbourne, Australia, on the 13th of May, 2012. This is Session 1, Part 2. Um, now, uh, let's uh, proceed with the second half of this discussion, shall we? Which is the issue of morality. So, what I would like to do is define morality quite loosely for you. Which is this. Treating other, treat others and yourself how God wants each all his children oops going ahead of myself here, to be treated. So um, with the first thing, with, with the ethics, if you like, the first, uh, the first thing here, treating other people how I would like to be treated myself would uh, be, a, as you can see from our previous discussion, would confront a lot of areas of our life and would help us become far more uh, ethical and loving in our behaviour towards each other. You can see that? This one here, of course, is now an extension of that. We're now extending that into how does God want all of her children to be treated? That's how I need to treat everyone else. And, and myself, actually, how God wants all of her children to be treated. So actually, you are out of harmony with morality even if you treat yourself how God doesn't want you to be treated. While you may be in harmony with ethics, you are out of harmony with the of morality. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And now, this issue is a very, very big issue. Um, because firstly, we need to then make some, um, we need to have some feelings about how God wants all of her children to be treated, don't we? Now, of course, many religions have done that emotionally and, uh, and, they, and intellectually they've done that and they finish up treating people very badly. In fact, wars have been created about how religions believe God wants them to treat another religion, for example. Complete wars have been created about that. But of course, these two um, points are not mutually exclusive. Do you know what I mean by mutually exclusive? We're not saying you can do that without doing that or do that without doing that. So if I had this viewpoint inside of myself that God wanted me to punish other people for not being of the same religious faith that I am, Let's say I had that viewpoint and I believe that to be true. Asking myself the first question would confront that viewpoint because I wouldn't want to be punished myself for having a different religion than another person. So, so how can I then justify treating another person badly because of having a different religious faith than myself? So we need to add both of these two statements together to create what would be loving action towards other people. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, unfortunately, um, most religions do this only. The reason why I raised the first issue with religions in the first century is because most religions do this bit that I've done a ring around here. And they make a lot of suppositions about how God or what God wants without any consideration to the first ethical issue. OK? 
Can you see that? In other words, what they do is they say, oh, God wants me to, uh, you know, expel homosexuals from my, from my um, congregation. That's what it says in the Bible. So that's what we're doing. But if, if they ask themselves, would they like to be expelled as a heterosexual from the congregation? They would probably say, well, no, I wouldn't like to be expelled in any, for anything that I'm doing from a congregation. So how can they then justify the second statement as to what God wants. Does that make sense? And the reality is, one of the things God wants is for us to do the first thing. <laughs> so that's what we also need to bear in mind. God wants us to only consider treating other people how we would like to be treated. That's one of the things God also wants. Because obviously, once we ask ourselves that first question... We have the capacity to understand what kind of treatment most of us are able to accept and what kind of treatment is unloving that we can't accept. Right? But this second issue is very important and, and the reason why I raise it as the morality rather than ethics is because normally what happens on the planet is that people decide what's moral and what's not. Does it make sense? That's what people do. People do it. What I'm suggesting is the only person who has the right to tell us what's right and what's wrong is God. And I'm not saying he's going to do that in a book that people have written because that's open to interpretation and misinformation and also falsification. He's going to have to do it by having some kind of communication with your heart is the way that it's going to have to work. Some kind of communication with your heart. So, issues of morality include issues such as is lying right or wrong? Is stealing right or wrong? Right? Is uh, embezzlement... <laughs> How do you spell it? Is that right? No, no, it's not good enough. It's just close enough. Is it one Z or two? <laughs> two Zs. Is it E L? Yeah. Right. So. Embezzlement. Um, is that right or wrong? From whose perspective? You know, from God's perspective. What about adultery? <coughs> what about what the Bible calls fornication? which is really just two people who are unmarried, having sex or so, so forth. What about homosexuality? What's, and so forth. We can continue listing things like to do with sex as well, masturbation and so forth. We can list all of these different things, can't we? In the end, the person who determines whether any of those things are what are right or wrong would be the person who created us for the purpose that he created us or she created us. So if we examine the purpose for which we were created, that is a fast way of determining what might be what that person might be interpreting as what's right or what's wrong. So it's a bit like um, a person who creates a knife. Do you think their intention originally, the, a person who creates a knife, was that it's used in a murder? No. So, because a, a knife has other roles, doesn't it? Like you can cut up food and you, you need it for doing all sorts of things. So, a knife, while it has the potential to be used in an unloving manner to harm, physically hurt or, or even destroy a person's life, or a loving manner to cut up food and help you eat and eat, you see, then you can see that a person who created the thing, their intention is involved 
in what its underlying use is. Now, if we examine that with regard to a knife, we could then go, okay, um, there is either a loving use of a knife or an unloving use of a knife. A loving use of a knife is to help people in their life. An unloving, unloving use of a knife would be to hinder people with their life. That would be an unloving use of a knife. Now, there has been people who create a, a knife just to injure people. A certain type of knife which is created just to harm people. So what's their intention? It's unloving intention because it, their intention is to harm. How about a uh, gun? Can you think of any loving use? You can't. You can? Let's, uh, let's uh, uh, if we get the microphone, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Depends on your degree of loving, but there are people that, that use guns for sports, so they're target. As in actual target, not to kill something. Okay, so they're using it for fun, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you could you could say that that is a loving use of a knife, could you? Of a gun. Well, what's the difference between that and using a football? There's not much difference, is there? No. No. <laughs> Everyone's a bit more fearful about guns. So potentially might be loving uses of a gun. Might there. There might be potentially loving uses of a gun. For example, you, you may I gave a talk recently about the use of free will. And in that talk I suggested to people that the, under certain circumstances, firing a gun at another person, not to kill them, but to but to to prevent them from acting, might actually be a loving thing to do if it's done with the right action and the, and the right intention. Right? And so, you know, there is a potential loving use of a gun, potentially. I'm not sure if there's a potential loving use of an atomic warhead um, <coughs> or anything like that. Because so. <laughs> you mass destruction there. It's not selective. Um, anything that is selective uh, has a potential loving use generally. Does that make sense? Anything that's selective has a potential loving use. And, and, of course, uh, most of the time the, there is an unloving use, isn't there, of a weapon like a gun. Turning it into a weapon rather than something else. So another unloving use of a gun would be to shoot animals with, have an unloving use of a gun um, and so forth. Okay. So when we say unloving and loving, who defines that? Because I'm sure a person who goes out shooting every weekend... Um, feels that they are still being loving. So can you see it has to be outside of the def definition of any human and it has to, the definition has to be related to somebody else, basically. And the best person who defines how the knife is to be used is its maker. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Is that also because inherent in the way they make the thing yes. is for its optimal use? Yes. Like if someone's creating a samurai sword, they're creating yes. it with... Uh, they The whole way they design the thing is to achieve like, I don't know, battle or death. Whereas if I'm designing a knife that's for um, cutting up... Carrots. Yep. That I, I'll design it completely differently, won't I? Although this person who designed a samurai sword could have the intention that they want to artistically display, move their yeah. body and display some kind of martial arts. You know, yep. what, and that's why it's called martial arts, yep. right? Some kind of martial arts in a way that demonstrates control and and uh, you know how they're not afraid of the weapon itself. And uh, you know, it can actually demonstrate some quite amazing principles to watch. Yeah. So the, I, the person who makes that one yeah. obviously has a different intention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess what I'm asking about though is the design, the the maker's intention. Yes. 
affects the design. Certainly. Which affects the optimal functioning of, of that thing. Certainly. Which I'm applying to the human soul and of God. Of course. <laughs> so, so let's now apply this properly to the human soul and the human body. So we rub all that out. So we apply this same principle. The maker of our human soul is God. He's also the maker of the human body. Right? And the spirit body as well. All of the potential genetic designs that come from the amalgamation of two halves of the gen genetic pr uh, process all came from this maker, this maker which we are calling God. Right? Surely then God knows the optimal use of the soul and the optimal use of the bodies attached to the soul. That makes sense, wasn't it? wouldn't it? And so it would make sense then that if we could find out the optimal use based on how God wants us to use our body and our soul, then we can bring our life into complete harmony with God's morality. Well, how God designed us to be. Now, the problem with this second section, though, is that we need to remember yesterday's discussion, how we talked about the things that we are unsure of, we need to experiment with. The things that we're sure of will become clear through the process of experimentation. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so what we need to do with regard to um, these issues is we need to examine how society have experimented with the issues of morality and the general effects of these issues on society and the pain that it's created in society. And therefore, we can measure the results of these society experiments that have been created. And therefore, we can see what the optimal usage of our body and our, and our spirit body and our soul can be by examining the results of its use over thousands of years of time. Does that not make sense? So, let's look at our physical body. So, we've got the male's physical body and the female's physical body. If the male or the female decide to have unprotected, which remember from the beginning, God didn't design prophylactics, right? And God didn't design any other form of contraception, right? That we know of as a human race at this point. That being the case, that if we decided to all not use any protection at all, with our body, which has been done in the past, and we decided to have lots and lots of sexual partners, what has been the result? Let's list the results. Disease. What kind of diseases? Sexually. So STD, sexually transmitted diseases. Yep. Uh, unwanted children. Yep. What else? So it's a sexually transmitted disease, yeah. yeah. Abortions, yes, because of the unwanted pregnancy, there's also been abortions, which is the taking of a child's un an unborn child's life, yes. Entrapment. Entrapment. There's been an entrapment of, say, uh, the woman wanting to marry somebody, they get pregnant, have a child, and they say it's yours. Now there's a feeling of the guy feels trapped. Entrapped. Yep. Why is divorce? Please explain. Oh, okay. So broken relationships. Let's call it that. I would argue that a, a broken relationships are caused by other things, mind you, not just the act of sex. <laughs> yes. But when we use uh, this sexual connection between a male and a female or between a female and a female, or between a male and a male, we get a lot of results. And many of these results, if it's done in an unprotected manner, like a, there's no condoms or anything to protect you from these results, these are the results that occur. Now, what I would do with that is I'd go, OK, if these are the results that occur as a result of us acting in a certain behaviour with the sexual organs we've been given, 
then it would make sense that since all of these things result in one main thing and that is pain, it would make sense then that m many of us or most of us in, in some times past perhaps have used these sexual organs in a way that is not loving and therefore not in harmony. The fact that it creates pain means that it's not loving and the fact that it creates pain means it must not be in harmony with our original design. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if it's not in harmony with our original design, we can certainly say through the process of experience, through the process of investigating the history of man, we can certainly say that certain actions can't be how God wants his children to be treated. Because how we've treated each other has caused so much pain. Can you see that? Okay. So we can then start going, okay, what? Let, so, let's, so we understand the relationship between the painful results and therefore certain things that must be not moral from God's perspective. Can you see the relationship? Yeah. Well, let's also look at it from the other end. Let's look at the pleasurable results of having sex. Oops. You get some intimacy, yes, Possi that's possible, isn't it? Yeah. The orgasm, which is pleasurable result. You get a wanted pregnancy, which is an aw awesome result. The creation of another child of God, pregnancy. There's got to be more reasons, otherwise you wouldn't want to do it so often, right? So let's... It's fun, okay, it's fun, yeah. There's an expression of love, yeah, in there, so that's possible. Uh, does that result from having sex? Isn't it something you need to know before you have sex, probably? <laughs> well, yeah, if we took this to the fur furthest extension, um, the reality is that we could completely have a way of preventing uh, a pregnancy if we wanted to prevent pregnancy um, by just controlling our own bodies. Um, yep. But let's look at what the results have been historically uh, rather than the results. We're talking about now the positive results historically that we've, we can see from having sex. Yep, so growth in self-awareness, I, I feel that happens. Sharing of self, let's put it in there, sharing self, which is a very positive thing to do, is a giving the gift of yourself to another person and the gift of your body to another person um, to use in, in a loving manner, which is a very loving thing to do. Yep. So trust also grows. Trust and everything grows as a result, yeah. Um, there are even far more than that, uh, if you think about it. There's, there's all these issues with regard to soulmates as well that you eventually open yourself up to experiencing. But let's, let's just leave it like that. Let's say we don't believe in soulmates, so we leave it like that. Okay. So these are all the positive results of uh, having sex. So, so obviously, from that we can see that God has actually did design us to have sex. So it would not make sense to then go, oh, to be a holy person... That, uh, that would require you to not have sex. Can you see that? Because obviously there's all these positive benefits from having sex. So, so now we've got to amalgamate the positives and the negatives together. Under what circumstances do the negatives occur? Is the question we need to ask ourselves. And under what circumstances do the positives occur? 
Right? And we need to m merge those two things together. Therefore, we'll be able to have a good guess, or the know that we may not know for certain, because we're not yet connecting with God, right? We may not know for certain, but we'll, from this experience, this experiment, this human experiment that's been going on that now six and a half billion or seven billion people are involved in, we can make some pretty good assumptions about what our original intention, what the original intention about our creation has been. Could we say this? If we amalgamate those two things together, what I'm putting to you is we can say a certain amount of fairly, fairly safe things as to what God intended us to do compared to, if we don't even believe in soulmates at this point, what God intended us to do with regard to our sexual relationships. Firstly, have sex. God intended us to do that because we would not have been given sexual organs and then are being asked to not use them. It's a crazy proposition to assume that that would be the case. So firstly, God designed us to have sex. But God designed us to have sex with one partner. Because the more partners we involve in sex, the more potential there, are for hurt, there is for hurt, and the more potential there is for unwanted pregnancies and the more potential there is for disease. Does that make sense? So that obviously is another, another thing. Now, I would extend some of these things with the knowledge that I have gained over other experiments. But, but once you look at the human experiment, you can make some fairly basic assumptions about God's original design. Any other things you can think of? When love is present. So when love isn't present when you have sex... It's not very good for at least one party. Right. Is that marrying these two up? Uh, it's marrying together the positives and negatives that I put on the board uh, just earlier. Yep. Yep. Mutual agreement. Very good. Mutual agreement is necessary. Mutual, shall we call it mutual desire rather than just agreement? Because obviously... Agreement and desire are very different to each other. Um, so like, so if one part heart is not very keen on having sex and you get together and decide to acquiesce in the act, then of course the other, part, the other party to the sex goes, wow, that wasn't very good sex, right? Because for, for sex to occur that's going to be really enjoyable, two parties need to have a strong desire for each other. Right? And when one party doesn't have much of a desire and the other one has a strong desire, the person with a strong desire often feels the lack of desire in the other party. The person who has a lower desire feels a bit oppressed upon. Them. And so you get all of these unhappy emotions as a result. Yeah? So obviously mutual desire is a very, very key part. Yeah? Is Joy? Desire Maybe we should be using yeah. a mic here because uh, we're not getting some of these comments. So. Yeah. To desire to have children and that you're going to love? That if children result, then they are loved. Yep. Very important, isn't it? So this is before we factor in things like contraception and all these other things. Through this human experiment that's happened over thousands of years, we can make some of these basic assumptions about what appears to be the actual design of the designer who created our sexual organs. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wanting to ask a summary question now, mm -hmm. which is about you're saying that if there's pain resultant from a certain set of actions, then we have to consider that our designer didn't design us to experience pain. Well, no, our designer designed us with the capability yes. of experiencing pain as a feedback mechanism. Yep. But our designer didn't design us with the intention that we've spent a whole life in pain. Yes, so mm. our designer created pain as a feedback mechanism. Yes, So telling us that something's wrong. Telling us that something's wrong. Mm. But also he designed us 
for pleasure and love. Exactly, to so, tell us that something's right. Yes. <laughs> yes. So this equation that you're going through with us is about how to discern what's moral, what our designer wanted from us yes. by examining the pain and the pleasure. And not just our own pain but the universal the, pain through the human experiment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Who else is suffering or who, who else, else is suffering is, yeah. and so forth, yeah. yes. Thank you. Yeah. So let's say you're in a marriage and one party no longer feels to be in love with the other. Are we now in or out of harmony with what appears to be God's design in terms of having sex? Out. out of harmony. It doesn't matter whether they're married or got a piece of paper or a certificate that says they're married or anything like that, does it? They're now out of harmony with the original design. It would not be appropriate for them ethically or morally to continue to have sex with their partner while they're not in love with them. Can you see that? Now that changes some complexions about relationships, doesn't it, if we look at it things in that way. What say... Um, um, I, I would take things to a further extreme, but what, all I'm doing at this point is actually presenting from the human experiment what we can gather... We don't even have to experiment ourselves with this because, you know, this is the human experiment that's been going on for thousands of years. You amalgamate all of those particular things from thousands of years and you get a very, very good idea of what was the underlying design in the intention, uh, the underlying intention in the design. So, this being the case, uh, let's say one of the party, of the couple who are having sex, don't want to have children. Well, is it out of honey? Are you sure? Do you want to use the mic when we make these comments? <laughs> everyone at the moment, if I just say for the camera, everyone at the moment is going, hmm. <laughs> and they're coming up with ideas. Um, I, I feel that... Um God doesn't, you know, want us to constantly have child after child, you know, necessarily. No. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but if we've got free will and if one person wants to um, have a child, uh, the other, it was open to getting pregnant, but the other one definitely doesn't want to have a child, um, then I feel that those um, emotions see? maybe need to be worked through before. Yes, so there is now an ethical problem, is there not? Yes, can you see the ethical problem? One party, maybe the wife wants to have a child, the other party, maybe the husband, does not want to have a child and they're still engaging in sex um, where there's a potential of having a child. So now there's an ethical issue yeah, for both parties actually. Because it, that you'd have to start asking yourself, well, you know, now it'd be different. There would be no ethical issue if both parties didn't want to have a child, would there? No. 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 Because if both parties didn't want to have the child and they're having sex um, and they have some way of uh, preventing the, the conception from occurring, then of course they're both in agreement and there's no ethical issue. Yeah. It's still by mutual desire, mutual agreement. Yeah. So all those husbands out there who are going, please don't get pregnant, please don't get pregnant when they have this sex with their wife who wants to get pregnant, need to have a look at their ethical relationship with their partner. Yeah. And of course the wife needs to too. If she knows that the husband's feeling that way, certainly. Yeah. Um, would you... It would be the same opposite... Wouldn't it? So of course. Like, why would you um, look at your emotions behind why you'd want to have a child as well? Of course. Yeah. You would always... You, obviously, it's to do with them being loved. If you want the child to love you, now you're way out of harmony with some pretty major ethical issues and also you're way out of harmony with morality with God. Because the whole person, per, per, per reason why God created children was to for God to love the children, not for the children to love God. We have, we have the will that we can exercise to not love God. And so therefore our own children, when we create them, have, are able to exercise their will to not love us. 
if they want to. And, and they're able to do that. And if we expect them to love us, and many parents do, we are already out of harmony with the gift of love and therefore out of harmony with morality. Yeah, I agree. Next. AJ, with the um, God wanting us to be with one partner... Yep. ...and you were talking before about a couple that have fallen out of love or... Yes. Is, is that talking about not moving... ..moving on to another partner is OK? Yes. Oh, right. So it's, not, it's more or less having one partner at one time. Not yes. A, yes. Yes. So the same with... Um, uh, the same sex um, doesn't matter. Relationship, it's the same sex, different sex. Yep, same okay. flies. As long as these it's mutual not issues, multiple partners at the one time. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Thanks, mate. Just um, you may not have touched on this yet, but about the um, you're talking about contraception. Yep. So, what is it about having? sex because you're enjoying it and th having the children. So that aspect of using some form of contraception. Well, the, the reality is that God designed us to have an internal contraceptive system. Um, the reason why women ovulate has yet to be scientifically and medically examined as to why they ovulate when they don't want to have a child. And the reality is that it's all to do with emotions that they have from very, very young age that they're not a woman yet until they have a child. And, yep. and the reality is if a woman does not ovulate, she can't get pregnant, mm -hmm. right? So, so the reality is that we have the ability in our own bodies to control ov ovulation and also control menstruation uh, in, in a, for a woman and therefore control pregnancy that way. A man also has the ability to to prevent his sperm from ever entering his, the ejaculation and, and in his own body. He doesn't, of course, because most men have the emotion that they want some progeny in the sense that they want to create some kind of longevity because they feel that them by themselves is not enough and they want some you know, evidence of their prowess, if you like. And so men have a whole group of emotions associated with themselves not being able to prevent a pregnancy. When the two sets of emotions are properly utilised, there is no chance of a pregnancy actually occurring without... Uh, and, and I'm saying under, under normal circumstances, if the soul is not engaged, the body would not engage the process of conception. Now, of course, mankind hasn't ever experimented with that because they're not developed enough yet to even consider that as a concept. Um, but that was the original intention of God's design. So there's nothing wrong with desiring to have lots of sex with your partner without the, the necessity to have children or prevent having children. Exactly. Such. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. However, we need to look at the emotional reasons why we need to use contraception rather than that happen naturally. Okay. Yeah, so there are emotional reasons for both, for both parties, for both the woman and the man. Okay, Tom. Yep. Thanks, Jane. So, AJ, when we start when we start dealing with those emotions of not feeling like a woman, like for myself, like because I haven't had a child, I feel like I'm not not a real woman. I've touched a little bit into that. Yeah. So, in the long run, in the next few years, perhaps then my periods will get um, lighter. Like maybe they'll, won't they'll stop. Go. Okay. So well, stop. once once you deal with that emo uh, yeah. a group of emotions your periods will stop altogether. Yeah. Your body won't even prepare itself for a pregnancy every month. Wow. Because okay. that's what your body is doing. I see that doing. as a shock. If, that, if I don't get my period, it's sort of like, wow, then there's a sh there must be something wrong. So yeah, because you think you're pregnant. So it's even dealing with those fears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the reality is, okay. <laughs> the reality is that um, once we deal with the group of emotions that cause uh, these kind of pregnancies to occur... Once we, once, which are all to do with needing a child, wanting a child to love you, there's all sorts of emotions associated with why a, a woman is very open from a very young age to be, becoming pregnant and why a man is very ready at a very young age to make a woman pregnant. There's a whole group of emotions associated with both the men and the women that need to be addressed. Once we address those particular emotions, you get, 
to the point where you only become pregnant when you have a passionate desire to have a child. And that has to be with your soulmate. And that w would, well, it would be under certain circumstances, yeah. which, which, which we can talk about soulmates. But at this point, I'm only looking, I'm only looking at the experience of mankind yeah. over an experimental period of time and what we can then assume based on what we've observed occur so far. Not even about what the future is. I'm talking about only about what we have observed have, has occurred historically. Does that make sense? So, historic, so in this discussion, I'm not discussing the possibilities of what could occur. I'm discussing the, what has actually occurred and what that tells us about our design. Does everyone get that? Yeah. So, so what this tells us about our design is these particular things, if these particular things are in operation then you will find that the sexual relationship will be very enjoyable and will have, be completely risk-free. Right? Now, that obviously then results in no pain. So you could put all of those things together and say that all results in no pain. And if it all results in no pain, then obviously it is a higher likelihood... We're not knowing for certain at this point because it's just an experiment that, we tried to, that we've carried out for many thousands of years. But there's a higher likelihood that these assumptions that we've now made about God and God's design of us with regard to sexual morality must be fairly true or fairly correct. Because we've had thousands of years to test it and it's become quite obvious that anything outside of that creates pain. Can you see that? And therefore, it becomes obvious that from a sexual perspective, these particular things must be a part of what you would call God's sexual morality. Now, as you get closer and closer to God, you realise that there's other things involved in it as well. In fact, you'll find that there's a soulmate, this design issue of the other half of yourself, and there's a lot of other things that are involved in it. But you might not know that at the beginning of any experiment, right? All, all we can do from all of these experiments that man has done over hundreds of, uh, and thousands of years is to add together the results and can compare them to what must be moral, if that makes sense. Mary? I feel I'm engaged in an experiment. Yeah. <laughs> and so I want to say something and ask something that's probably fairly contentious. Yeah. I feel it's immoral to have sex with anyone but your soulmate. Yeah. And I feel that true love cannot be present. This is my question though. I'm not sure. I'm still experimenting. Yeah. But I don't feel that love, and I mean love, not barter or a sharing of addiction in a relationship, will not be truly present in a sexual way, in its sexual expression, unless I'm with my soulmate. Is that true? Well, uh, that is a truth, yes. But it's not yet a truth that mankind generally has discovered. No, I understand yes. that. I'm sorry if I'm taking yeah. away from that. Yeah. So, no, I agree completely with what, what you're saying, yeah. um, as you know. But, but, <laughs> well, uh, I wasn't sure on the second bit about the love. I th yeah, no, I agree I completely feel, but, with everything yeah. you're saying, as you know. And, but, um, but it's not what man's discovered. No. So, so if we look just generally at through the mankind's experience, you know, humankind's experience over thousands of years, we've at least discovered this. And on my feelings, if we engaged that with sincerity, we would soon discover that last bit. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. We would get to the point where we find only one partner with whom we can have sex. <laughs> Whether they wanted to have sex with us or not <laughs> becomes immaterial. And, uh, and if they don't want to, then we don't finish up wanting sex with anyone else. So we get to that point as we develop. But, but at this stage, most of mankind are not at that developed place, but they have at least worked out these things. Yep. And so therefore, we can then presume that these things must be a part of God's morality. Unless we get some further experimentation that proves otherwise. And this is the issue that we have with morality, is that we are going to have to examine it through the eyes of some kind of experiment. Through, because unless we are connected with God, we are not going to know God's desire. Right? And so therefore we're going to have to experiment. The, the faster way, of course, to deal with this issue as to what is right with regard to sexual morality is to actually connect to God. 
Because when you connect to God, very, very rapidly you sort out the issues. Oh, I feel bad if I have sex with anyone other than my soulmate. So straight away that means it must be God's intention. <laughs> you know, I feel bad if even with my soulmate, love's not present. So I, therefore I can't have sex if love's not present, even if it's with my soulmate. So it feels bad. So straight away I can feel that. Straight. All of these things, in fact, you can feel very rapidly once you connect with God directly. But I'm saying that we all on the planet have the choice to either connect with God or not. And that being the case, there must be a way to measure morality aside from the connection with God. And there is. And that is by examining through the experiment of the human condition what has resulted in pain and what has resulted in no pain. And then, obviously, the thing that is no pain is the intention of the design, yeah. which makes sense, logically. Okay. Is there any questions? When I do these intellectual reasonings, you still struggle with some of them. So, I, or do I say them so quickly? That it's like, what did you say? What did you say? Is that what happens? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. It's just... It is so in, built inside of me that it's so easy to say um, without, you know, and I understand that listening to it, sometimes you have to listen to it again and go, what was that again? What was that again? And so I, I get that process is a, is a necessary process. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about connecting with God? Um, sure, but in the... I suppose you could say I've... I've done that a lot in terms of a discussion. Have you seen The Way presentation? The one called The Way. Oh, I haven't I? seen it, but I have heard it. Yeah. yeah. Um, my suggestion is to watch okay. that for over and over. Because that's a lot about connection with God. Um, but you talked about the feeling. It, it, feels, it feels good or it feels bad. Yes, what happens inside of you when you have released the emotions that cause any negative uh, connotation to exist, in neg in negative feelings to exist inside of yourself, any fear-based feelings, in other words. So I'm, a lot of religions come at these morals, what they would call morals, from a fear-based perspective. Like, I'm not coming at them from a fear-based perspective. All I'm saying here with these morals is that through the human condition and experiment, we have found that certain things cause pain and certain things don't. And in the process, we need to examine that openly and say, oh, okay, these things don't seem to cause pain. These things don't seem to cause pain to anybody, children or the mutual partners involved. And so therefore, there's a high likelihood that that was our original design intention. So right. we need to have an open heart to be able to feel. Yes. That. Now, let's factor in God into this process. If God was factored into this process, what would happen is this. I would not look at, I need to look at anything that's happened to the human condition and experiment. So I could rub all that out. And all I need to do is, number one, heal, heal my relationship. It's a P. Relationship with God. That's number one. When I heal my relationship with God, I can start to feel God. It's only when I heal that relationship that I can feel God. The way that I go about doing that is I also need to be involved in number two, which is healing my relationship with Myself. Myself including the other half of myself or the soul mate. Right? Now once I heal my relationship with God and I heal my relationship with myself and I focus on, the, on doing those two things only, I become very certain very quickly in that process of what is right for myself and what feels wrong for myself. Everyone gets that? Mm. So, and the reason why I do is I can feel what is painful and what is not. Mm. And so I then know very, very quickly what is right and what is wrong without having to look at the experiments that other people have done. Right? I don't need to do that doing this. 
But in this discussion of morality, I've, I've been suggesting that if we can't do that, we still have these ways of determining what is right and wrong by looking at the human experiment. So we still we, we can't sit down and go, oh, I'm not connected with God and I'm not connected with myself, so I don't really know what the truth is. It's not true. You can look at the human experiment and see through the pain in the human experiment where the truth is. You don't even have to be connected to anything to do that. You can just sit back and say, I'm not connected to God, I'm not connected to myself, but you can still look and you can still see what obviously is right in the sense of what we were, our original design intention was to be and what is wrong in the sense of what is outside of our design parameters. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. When you do this, heal your relationship with God and heal your relationship with yourself, you don't need to examine the human condition over thousands of years but you will not only result it, this will not only result in you knowing the same thing as the thousands of years of experiments demonstrate but you'll know some more additional things and one of the additional things you'll know is that soulmates exist and until once i am open to my soulmate i cannot be open to anyone else well, that's one of the things you discover through that process but if you decide not to heal your relationship with yourself or heal your relationship with God, there is still a means of determining what our original design parameters are that cause the least pain. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So, so we can't use the excuse, oh, but I'm not connected with God or I'm not connected to myself, so therefore I do not know. Because the reality is, if we examine the human condition, we can easily find out. In the other people have made the experiments for us, yes. With um, the healing, yep. can you go to someone to walk you, support you, hold your hand through your own process? Or would you prefer it that each individual person does it on their own? Well, initially you can go through, you know, getting somebody to hold your hand through the process, but they're not going to be able to hold you through the entire process because part of the process is letting go of their hand and having to do it on your own. So, so while it might be good for you to begin the process by having someone hold your hand and educate you and show you what to do and all those kind of things, sooner or later you're going to have to stand on your own two feet. That's a part of growing up and that's also a part of healing, healing your relationship with yourself. And so in the end, you're going to have to, whoever's holding your hand, at some point in the future, you're going to have to be willing to let their hand go so that you can complete the process. Now, what I personally find is the earlier that you can learn to let every, somebody else's hand go, but still continue the process, usually the faster you go on the process. Because while you got hold of their hand, you're now attached yourself to their will. And you've now attached yourself to what they do in return. So you're still in some kind of addiction with the other person. And, and unless you let go of that, you're not going to fully be in this connection with God. Yep. So, but, that, but there is some advantages right at the beginning in doing that because you need to be educated, you need to be shown, you need to be taught, you need to you know, learn how to do these things. And that requires somebody who has, is in front of you showing you what to do. And so this is why in the spirit world there's like literally millions and millions of spirits who are showing other spirits what to do. But they don't hold their hand for the entire journey. Yeah. They let go of the hand and the person becomes more and more self-responsible. And as soon as you become at one with God, actually at that time, you are now completely self-responsible. So you do not need to hold the hand of another in order to uh, reach the condition of at one with God. Yep. Good question. All right, so... If I heal those two things, and I won't discuss in this discussion how to heal them, I'll just say that if I do heal them, then I can determine, because of my relationship with God and myself now, that's established completely, I can determine now what God's morality is on all sorts of issues, not just sexual morality, but all sorts of issues of morality. Let's uh, look at some other issues of morality that don't involve sex, but rather involve... Um, what happens in relationships. So let's say there's two people, there are two guys, 
And the first guy decides that it's right for him to steal from the second guy. Can you describe to me what goes on there emotionally and physically? What is the act of stealing? Die. It's taking without permission. Right. So taking without permission, yeah. Uh, what's its result? What's its result? Can you tell me what the results are? How does it feel? How does it feel on the receiving end? Have you? Who's had stuff stolen from them? Yep, most of us. So, okay. So you can tell me what it feels like. Yeah, with Mike. It feels um, bad. Like you, um, you feel like your trust has been broken with them. And so there's a feeling of broken trust. Yeah. 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 Yes. There's, yeah. there's a feeling sometimes of abuse, yeah? Violation. Violation. Loss. Loss. Invasion. Invasion. Disbelief. <laughs> yeah, there's disbelief, that's for certain, a lot of times, yeah? Yeah, All right. yeah I couldn't believe it that someone would steal something from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's sort of like, particularly for somebody that you knew. Is well, no, I was, oh, I, was a, I was a young kid and I said, can you just watch my bike while I go and play this game? And I come out and my bike was gone. I was just like, Who, why would someone steal my bike? Couldn't yeah. believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Disbelief, <laughs> yeah. 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 So would you say those are painful or pleasurable experiences? Painful. Okay, painful. So what does pain tell us? <laughs> that it's got to be a moral error. Right? So... Anything that creates this pain has to be a moral error. So stealing must be an immoral act. Isn't that a pretty valid assumption? Okay. Mary's got something to say. I can hear it behind me. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed by my... I, I want to ask... Let's use the example of truth-telling. Yeah. Or sometimes, are you done with stealing? Am I done with stealing? Yeah, I, am I, I don't know. Are we the done with? Have, we, have I stopped stealing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, some of the emails I get tend to indicate that they think I haven't. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I, I'd just really love it if you wouldn't mind um, giving us the example of if. This we're talking about relationships now. There's two guys, and one guy tells the truth to the other one. Okay, so two guys. One guy tells the truth. He decides that it's right to tell the truth to the other person. Okay. How does everyone feel? How does the receiver feel? <laughs> what if he tells the truth? I stole from you, mate. You didn't know, and I stole from you. Yeah, that's, Is good. That that's a good being truth, too yeah. contentious. Well, or? that's even adding some extra complexity to the yeah. problem, yes. <laughs> but he tells the truth. And obviously the truth may affect the person in some way, wasn't it? This person here may affect the person in some way. Okay. So, so this is now where it starts getting difficult for many people to determine because who feels pain? A lot of times the recipient, the recipient feels pain. Now, of course, if this person telling the truth does it with an attitude of rage, fear, resentment, attack, superiority, yeah, arrogance, then how will the recipient feel? Really bad, weren't they? Like, so obviously now we're starting to do, deal with issues of attitude as well as what, what is morally right with regard to our attitude. Then Sorry? Then you're not out of the home of the ethics then. We That's right. So now we're adding this with this and now we're having to look at our intentions. 
which, is, which requires a lot more refinement in our condition of love than it does just to look at the results over a period of thousands of years, the general results of something. To look at our attitude, we need to know what our attitude is. We need to be developed enough to actually feel what our attitude is to look at it. And so now we're starting to examine things like attitude and attitude of the giver of the truth in this case. So if the attitude of the giver of the truth is this, then the person who's giving the truth firstly isn't ethical because he's not treating the other person as he would like to be treated. He wouldn't like to receive anger, rage or fear or resentment or attack or condescension. So why is he giving it? He's already out of harmony with point number one. He's already out of harmony with ethics. And of course, since he's out of harmony with ethics, he must also be out of harmony with morality. Right? So he's got to be out of harmony with both, if the attitude is incorrect. But let's say that that's not the case. Let's say the attitude that this person has, so the attitude that the giver has, is an attitude of love, uh, concern for their spiritual welfare, their long-term welfare, uh, kindness, compassion, understanding, etc. Now we could say the giver at least is in harmony, is he not? with the first issue, at least. And there's a likelihood, since he's in harmony with the first issue, that he's possibly in harmony with the second. Possibly. Because there's one additional thing that needs to be done to be in harmony with the second. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a, there's a number of different additional things to be in harmony with the second. To be in harmony with the second, it has to be God's truth. And it has to be done in harmony with the laws of free will. Then he's in harmony with the morality issues. Does that make sense? So you could say, if we examine the issue, you could say, if he does deliver the truth with this attitudes then he is in harmony with the ethics and he delivers the truth with this attitude, then he's also in harmony with God's morality. Okay. So if we use the example of, say, um, say I've stolen from Fab and Fab doesn't know it, yes. I'm actually acting in harmony with free will to tell him that I've done it, haven't I? You are. Because he, he, he has his will right, may be affected by he this He has truth. the right to know it and yeah. the right to make a choice now that he knows it. Yeah. Yeah, because yes. I often hear people talking about things in marriages, infidelity, things like that, and they justify um, not saying a truth because, because they think it the other person yeah, the, might be hurt. Yes. Yes. When in actual fact... Remember, at this point, we have only analysed the giver's emotion here. Yeah. Not the receiver's yet. Uh, just the giver. Mm. Right. Yes? Well, if you take that one step further and you... Uh, hypothetically, I know something about your relationship yep. and Mary's done something to you and I'm your friend mm -hmm. and... I find that Why really wouldn't you be Mary's friend? No, I mean, like, I'm both your friends. Of so, course. But, <laughs> but, I'm, but, but being your friend, I know this secret that Mary's holding from you and yes. it's very getting difficult for me to have a relationship with both of you, especially you, because I know these secrets. Every time we're together, I know this secret. I can't say it. I've been yeah. told not to say anything. Yeah. Does that go into being in harmony with truth by telling Mary to say something to you? Well, wouldn't love of Mary, for a start, dictate that you say something to me? Yes. And wouldn't love of me dictate that you say something to me? Yes, but should I, would I first tell Mary to tell you before of, I... Of course. You'd yeah. give, if you loved her, you'd, be, you'd want her to give you, uh, her the option yeah. of telling me first rather than... free will, yeah. Yeah, you want her to give her option. But, but I also have the free will that, that I, I need to know as well, right? I'll so you don't want to know. 
Sorry? <laughs> you probably don't want to know. Well, no, that's not necessarily true. Yeah. Um, but you don't know that yeah. until you say it. Yeah. You're not going to know. Yeah. So, yeah, the, my, my feelings are in that situation. It's quite obvious that firstly, if you love Mary, you'd want Mary to have the opportunity to tell me. And if you love me, whether Mary took the opportunity to tell me or not, you'd want to tell me still. I suppose I see also in living example um, when someone has entered into a situation like Fab's and given the opportunity, say it's me to tell you and I haven't taken it or and then Fab would tell you and then both me and Fab get angry at Fab. <laughs> so there's pain. Me and you, you mean, get angry at Fab. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting yeah. so confused. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Who's telling what? But yeah. yeah. Um, we both get angry at Fab. And so you could easily look at that and go, well, there's just pain all around. No, but not. if you look at it years down the track, there's so much healing and growth that happens from that truth. Yes. Remember, pain doesn't necessarily mean that it's instant. Mm. We've got to measure the pain over periods of time. Yeah. This is why when I encourage you to look at how the world treats his other sexually, over thousands of years, I said. right? Because we need to examine it over a period of time to see what the general reaction is. So in the case of a relationship, in a relationship where one person is cheating on the other, there is obviously large amounts of problems over a long period of time that result from those particular things, both to the person who's done the cheating, there's guilt and other emotions that they've not released, and on the person who's not heard about it, there would obviously be a lot of pain once they hear, hear about it. They realise that, you know, that they don't have the relationship they imagine, which is also an issue uh, with regard to pain. So the reality is the pain began the moment the person cheated not the moment the person somebody said not the moment somebody said something about it the pain has already begun now um, in this case what we're doing is we're saying that the truth teller in this case in your example would be fab the truth teller telling the truth firstly to mary i know that you've cheated on aj or i know that you've done something in your relationship with aj that he should know about that i feel he should know about that it's right for him to know about and if you were loved him you would tell him um, I'm going to give you the opportunity to express that love for a week or two. But if you don't express that love to him in a week or two, then I have to express that love to him because I love him too. And, and Mary then says, I'm blackmailing you. And Mary says that I'm blackmailing you. Well, now, yes. Now, now, we're talking about, <laughs> now we're talking about the receiver, aren't we? Oh, it's all happened to me. <laughs> it's all happened to Fab. So, so, so firstly, we want to address the attitude sorry, of the giver. Yes? Mm. So we've addressed the attitude of the giver, and the giver is now, so you in this case, is now, are now in a condition of, of harmony with ethics because mm -hmm. you would like to be told if something was, if it was you and your partner was cheating on you, you'd like to know. Yep. Um, so, so you're in a harmony with ethics and you're also in harmony with God's morality in the sense that God would like all of his children to treat each other ethically and God would like all his children to know the truth about their relationships. So you're now in harmony with God's morality and you're also in harmony with pure ethics. So the attitude of the giver is now established as being perfectly in harmony with God and with ethics, with morality and ethics. Agreed? Yes. Okay. Now let's look at the attitude of the receiver. If we're going to look at the attitude of the giver of truth, we need to also examine the attitude of the receiver of truth. <laughs> is not not? Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes. So let's look at the attitude of the receiver. What is the potential attitude of the receiver if they are out of harmony with these two things? So they might get angry, R resentful, yeah. <laughs> feel punishing, they might attack the truth giver, they might try to make his life miserable, yes. <laughs> they might uh, try to do something in return to, um, to threaten, so they might actually blackmail emotionally or physically the giver 
people think that they give us the blackmailer. Well, that's one way they blackmail them, yes. Mm. The way of blackmailing a giver is to accuse the giver of blackmailing them, yes. You know, that connects with emotions of guilt in the giver and then the giver starts, can it, uh, do I, am I doing the right thing or not? And then because there's a question about whether they're doing the right thing or not, the giver doesn't give in love. Yep. Now, if that is the attitude, can you see the receiver is out of harmony with ethics? That's not how they'd like to be treated, is it? They wouldn't like to have someone angry with them. They wouldn't like to have someone resentful of them. They wouldn't like to have someone trying to punish them. They wouldn't like to have someone attacking them. And they wouldn't like to have someone blackmailing them. So how dare they blackmail the other person emotionally? So if Mary engaged with you and said, you're blackmailing me, you go, hang on a sec, I'm not. And you are now blackmailing me by accusing me of blackmailing you. All I'm doing is acting in harmony with love, which you have not done. You know, and you're now blackmailing me by trying to get me to not act in harmony with love. Yeah? So can you see the attitude of the receiver instantly is out of harmony with ethics and so for, therefore the receiver is not ethical and therefore can't be moral. Right? So what would be the ethical attitude of the receiver? Right, so humility, gratitude, perhaps grief, feeling their own grief, feeling their own fear. Humiliation. Uh, well, that's sort of not a humble mm -hmm. response, is it? Mm -hmm. They might desire repentance. They'd be self-reflective. And if they were in harmony with God, what would they do? They would desire God's truth. About the cause of why they did what they did but if they ref if they did this at least they'd be in harmony with ethics because that's exactly what they'd expect from another person who they told the truth to and wouldn't they like if they had to go and tell the truth to somebody else they'd like them to be humble and to be grateful and they'd like them to you feel their grief and feel their fear rather than projecting it at them. They'd like them to go into repentance if they could and they'd at least like them to be a little self-reflective. Right? And if they were in harmony with God, they would actually desire to get to the bottom of the whole problem. They would want to actually work out what was the reason why they did what they did in the first place. As soon as they don't do that, they're not in harmony with morals. As soon as they don't do that, they're not in harmony with ethics. Can you see everything's quite simple when you boil it down to those two lines in a lot of ways. It's quite simple to determine what's going on. All right. Okay. Here's a more difficult one. So I feel that one's pretty easy. That one. <laughs> a father and his child is the situation right. and the child in the action wants to hit his father wants to physically punch or hit his father So what's the child's uh, attitude? So there must be some anger, mustn't there? Yeah. Aggression. Aggression. And it could be frustration, yeah. Good. 
Disrespect. This is the child's attitude. That wants to punish, yeah, obviously. Wants revenge, yes. Yeah. Resents, resents his father. Um, yeah, I don't know. Somebody hits another person. It's very unlikely they're afraid. <laughs> you do know what I mean? Uh, could be, but now we're starting to assume uh, about in terms of what the underlying motive was. If we just take a look at the action, obviously the action has a number of different things involved. Okay, are they in harmony with ethics? So the child is being unethical. Okay. Now we're only looking at the attitude of the child at this point. But the right. child is so small that it doesn't really know that it's being ethical or not, isn't it? It's just the really child is totally capable of knowing whether it's being ethical. Okay. Actually, this is one of the misunderstandings we have about our children. We, we think that because they're three years age coming up and hitting us, they don't really understand what they're doing. Yeah. They dead right understand what they're doing. They know they're hitting us and they know they're causing pain. Yeah. <laughs> That's their whole intention. That's why they're doing it. That's why they're doing it. Yeah. Right? They understand oftentimes far better than we do what the underlying, uh, underlying feeling is. Yeah. We, often, we often believe and allow our children to get away with murder, as the saying goes, because we believe that they uh, don't really understand when they have a great understanding emotionally of what they feel. And we need to focus them on what they feel. So if I focus my child on what they feel... What are you feeling, son? Like, yes, you're feeling angry and upset and whatever. Now, he could be what other people might determine justfully upset. But th this is a different discussion. Now we're talking about the fa father's attitudes, which we need to also have a look at. But can you see the child is uh, uh, treating his father unethically? Okay. So therefore, the child is out of harmony with God's morals as well. Because it's not right to treat another person unethically. Yep. Okay, let's look at the attitude of the father. This is, this is the father's attitude. What, what, whoops, attitude. Attitude, attitude. Um, what is the father's attitude? What would be most father's attitude on the planet, probably? That'd be angry in return. Hurt. How many of you have had your, your child hit you or bite you or, you know, attack you in some way? Some of you, yeah. Okay, so you know what the feelings are. What, what were you feeling? Disappointed. Disappointed? Shocked. What, what, if, what, if the ch what if you'd done, just done something to the child? What, what would you feel? Guilt. Guilt? Yeah. All right. Defensive, yeah. Controlling, Controlling yeah. Unloved. Unloved. Big one women feel when their children hit them. Yeah. Ashamed. Especially in public. Especially in public, yeah. Um, bad parent, that's really about shame, really, isn't it? Shocked. Sorry? Shocked. Sh shocked? It's already there. Okay. So now, are all of these fear-based actions, are these things you'd like to feel from somebody else? Mm -mm. No. no. So you're already unethical <laughs> as a parent when you feel those particular things. What, what would be the ethical feelings of a parent? Well, there'd be some feelings of love, but let's define them. We'd have compassion. A desire to help them. A desire to correct. Listen. 
listen, maybe. Yeah. You would perhaps understand. Uh -huh. Yep, you want to be humble to the experience, so you'd want to look at yourself, wouldn't you? Yeah. And see uh, what inside of me might have attracted my child to actually hit me. And a lot of times it could be just the fact that the child knows it's going to get away with it. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> that might be what's inside of you, this feeling that you should let your child get away with murder. Yeah. Many parents have that feeling, by the way, yeah. that they're willing to let their child get away with things they'd never let anybody else get away with. Like, would you let me come up and bop you in the nose? <laughs> No? But I've, I've, would you, you ladies, would you let me come up and punch you in the breast? No. No. I've seen many of your children do exactly that. Yeah. Punch somebody, a woman, another woman in the breast. Like, you know, those people who have children. I've seen them do that. Would you, you wouldn't let me do it. So why would you let them do it? There's something wrong. There's obviously an emotion inside of you where you go, oh, it's my child. I'm allowed to let them get away with murder. Would you, would you let your child sexually abuse another child? Would you be happy if your own child got sexually abused? Of course. So it would be unethical to let another child be abused by your child, would it not? But I've seen that happen too. Right. Okay, so the attitude of a loving father here who is in harmony with his ethics would be he'd love the child, he'd have compassion for the child... This is very important. He would desire to correct the child's unloving behaviour with regard to the ethics. He would need to do something to correct the child's unloving behaviour. He might that might involve listening, it might involve understanding and being humble, but it also might involve restricting free will of the child. Because if the child is exercising its free will in a violent manner, then you've got to restrict it. You've got to somehow stop the child from exercising its will in a violent manner. Of course, if you do that and then you realise, oh, I've exercised my will in a violent manner, <laughs> then you'd have to deal with your own actions as well, wouldn't you? Thanks, Joy. Um, we, if we might. Yeah. Is there a desire to want to teach? Uh, there's no sound coming through, so just... Thanks. Is there um, a desire to want to teach the child as well as just correct... Yes, well that's what I mean by correct. Uh, I use the word correct. Let's uh, define the word correct. I call it discipline. And the word discipline comes from the word disciple, which comes from the word to teach. Does that make sense? So yeah, a person, no, a person being taught is a disciple. When you're being taught, you're a disciple. So the word discipline comes from the, from the action of being taught something. Right? And so when we desire to correct, we desire to give discipline, which is actually the action to give teaching to the person who needs correction. Is that, everyone follows that? Okay. So, so that's the action of correction, the desire to teach. Yes. Okay. Now, if he was in harmony with God's morality, what would he teach? God's truth. Yeah. God's laws and truth and the ethical use of free will. The child, by hitting his father, is demonstrating the unethical use of its own free will. The parent, if he loved the child, would have to correct the child so that they had an ethical use of their free will. And he'd have to take some form of correction that restricted the child's free will but did so in a non-violent or aggressive manner. Right? So... And I, in the discussion about free will that I gave a few weeks ago, I discussed what non-violence is. And non-violence includes no emotional violence. Okay. So, Tara, thank you. This would still be the same if you were the parent observing two of your children doing that to each other. Of course. 
Yes? Can you see these, uh, these principles apply to every situation that we can ever think of? There is always unethical behaviour usually once violence is, uh, occurs and therefore there is something that has to be done by one or both parents or involved. But something has to be mm. done or said at least, yes. Whether in fact the child wishes for that particular thing to happen or not, actually. Because the child itself is, is unfortunately now learning to utilise its free will in an unethical and violent manner. Um, Isaac's 12 now, so he's getting quite <laughs> yes. big and hard to He might take three people to hold him down, yes. Right, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. like, uh, it, what would you do with an adult? You might put them in a padded cell and lock the door. Yes. To restrict them from their unethical use of their violent... ..their violent and unethical use of their own free will. Certainly. Yes, so we're not, I'm not, a lot of people think, oh, he's all about love and so therefore he's all about tolerance of bad behaviour. No, tolerance of bad behaviour is not loving. This is something we need to come to terms with. Tolerance of emotionally bad behaviour is not loving. Tolerance of physically bad behaviour is not loving. To the person involved or to the person that they perpetrated their action upon. It's not loving to either of those. Thanks, Joy. Um, so would I do the same thing if it wasn't my child? I'm in a family situation, but there's Definitely. somebody else's children. I, would, I, I do it with people I don't even know. Right. And of course, they're totally confronted with that. And a lot of the fathers want to bop me in the nose or something. <laughs> but, but honestly, how, how can I allow a child mm. to come up and hit me? Mm -hmm. Without taking some corrective action, mm. I can't. And if he hits somebody else? Uh, well, if he hits somebody else, mm. then that person who he's hitting needs to take the corrective action. And if they don't? Well, then they've got some things to learn okay. about love. Right. Yes. Right. I, I can hear that hiss again, baby. <laughs> Far away. <laughs> It's my song I'm about to talk about. Talk it. Yes. <laughs> so you would, uh, in that instance that Joy just gave, where someone's hitting somebody else, uh, you would give teaching to both people involved in that situation. Definitely, you? I would yeah. talk to the person who's receiving the hit. I would talk to the parent if uh, if the parent would receive the information. A lot of times the parent won't, uh, but if I would talk to the parent and I'd talk to the child too if I had the opportunity and it was happening right next to me, I'd probably say something. Um, it depends a little, doesn't it? Because now we're talking about what is their free will, what, what, you know, and the fact that it's not impacting upon myself um, is part of the issue. However, the fact that it is impacting upon someone else, and it, particularly if that someone else is a child, it definitely needs to be addressed. If the someone else is an adult, then it would be more inappropriate to act without that adult acting. If that somebody else is a child, it would always be appropriate to act, whether that child is the child of the person perpetrating the action or not. The reason why is because the child does need come some kind of protection from the perpetrated act. Um, in a family where the siblings are um, at each other, yes, um, and there will have to be action to separate them, like you said, and talk to them, correct their behaviour. So let's look at it. Okay. Detail, shall we? Yep. Yep. You want to raise what you want to raise first, and oh, I was just going to say, in mum. The oh yeah, sorry. I'll just draw it first. Mum and dad, and then there's children. Which might let's make there's two boys and a girl, right? Which is my family, two boys and a girl. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, next stage. Okay. Um, as they're fighting and stuff like that, and it continues, sort of so thing. And siblings are bickering, fighting, yep. causing problems with each other. Yep. Yes. And there has to be corrective behaviour by the parents. There does. But um, in the end, it's going to be the parents' emotions. Is it that they're just playing out? Not necessarily, because it could also be the emotions of people in the environment. If the parents have gone out to dinner or something and there's people around the person, 
the children, it could be their emotions that are affecting the children now. So uh -huh. it might not be just the parents' emotions that are affecting the child. Yep. It could also be spirits overcloaking the children because the parents are going away from their own bodies. So mm -hmm. it could be an issue of the parents disconnecting from their life and then spirits overcloaking the children and causing the children to fight with each other. So there could be a number of different possible causes. If we look at the attitudes of the parents in terms of what would love do or what would the ethical behaviour do? So what would the parents do? Oh, the question? Oh. Yeah, fire away. Um, about the siblings fighting? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, it'd sort of be self-reflective, I suppose, if so I was a parent. Number one, mm. self-reflection. Mm. Yep. So self-reflection is really, is really what? The quality of... So firstly going, okay, what am I doing right now as a parent that seems to create, bang, this nightmare <laughs> that goes on in my, with, between my children? Right? Now, in that self-reflection, they would have to look at their intergender, so they'd need to look at intergender issues and same gender issues so in other words they need to look at are the boys fighting all the time <coughs> or is the boys fighting with the girl or are the girl is the girl attacking the boy all the time what what's actually going on does that make sense <coughs> they need to look at the intergender and same gender issues in a self-reflective manner yep okay th their attitude would be one of humility first however there also needs to be there needs to be action. There needs to be some kind of correction, doesn't there? You can't just sort of sit down there and you watch them fighting each other and one, you know, one so you're sitting down there as a parent and you're going, uh, yeah, I'm just feeling my feelings about this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and of course there's now bedlam, like right? they're going around there like the they're Chasing each other around with knives or something, and <laughs> you're going, yeah, I just need to. Obviously, you need to take some kind of corrective action, right? So, 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 it, part of the process is to take some immediate corrective action, but also to be very self-reflective in the process and to own the, your own feelings. So, if you notice, for instance, that the girl is attacking the boys or criticizing the boys all the time, and then the boys get sick of it and bop her in the nose, if that's what happens, then you'd have to look. Mum and Dad would have to look at their attitudes towards men and women, wouldn't they? Obviously, the girl is reflecting an attitude where she feels aggressive towards the male and wants to criticise and pull him down. And so she obviously feels like she's lesser than the male. So Mum would have to look at the issue of why she feels lesser than the male and feels the need to criticise the male. Dad would Then when the boy bops the woman then dad would need to have a look at the issue of why he feels that it's justified, violence is justified under some circumstances and conditions with when he gets attacked. Does that make sense? So, you know, they can be very, very self-reflective about those particular issues. It's ethical for the father and mother to be self-reflective, to have humility, to examine the intergender issues, but it's also ethical for them to take action. They must act to restrict... The free will because the free will is being used in an unethical manner amongst the children so there's got to be some kind of action taken yes Tara so this is my scenario yes. <laughs> two boys and the girl exactly um, if there's only one of us at home a parent mm -hmm. and all three of them are going off mm -hmm. How do you determine? You, because sometimes you don't. Tara, you <laughs> want to blame the other parent. <laughs> no, sorry. You want to blame the other parent. Oh, if there's three. Where? Ha, how did the emotions arrive in these children? From, from both of us. Both parents. Yeah. So it would be wise whether the parent, a parent, is home or not, for both parents to examine. With taking action, though, um, to correct behaviour. Yep. Um, it's pretty hard who to Who do you deal with first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, even if I try, I pick Zia up and just put her in a room to punch her pillow instead of punching her brother, 
while I, I then deal with that. the other brothers, the other the boys. Firstly, the person who's perpetrating the most violence, you grab hold Straight of away. and restrict. Okay. All right? And if that means holding them down on the ground and you sitting on top of them, that's what you do. When we hold Zia, she doesn't react. She just goes numb. When, that's because you the don't boys. hold her long enough. Ah. Uh, yeah, the boys react straight away. Of course. Mm. But you don't hold her long enough. She goes, if I just relax. <laughs> <laughs> a minute later, my mum's just going to get tired of yeah. me. <laughs> so you sit on her for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, right, until there's a reaction. Because there's always going to be a reaction from a restriction if, if their action has been violently unloving. Yeah. In other words, unethical. So, so, so the reality is, if our child is not reacting from a restriction, like this is what happened to some friends of ours, they did the restriction thing for a day or two, and then one of the children realised that he could plead and stop the restriction. He could go, oh, mummy, I can't, like, this isn't good, mummy, oh, you're hurting me, you're making me feel bad. I, you, you, and, and it just played on mummy's guilt so much that what does she do? Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> Smart cookie. Yeah. They learn very rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> what about... I did that with Isha. Yes. Uh, she's four years old. Yeah. And um, she went straight into this, you're killing me, Dad, I'm going to die, and yeah, all this yeah. kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And... Um, because she was hitting her mum. <laughs> yes. And, and then she went through all this. Then she went sort of limp and after that. And, and they then. go, yes. They'll go through all sorts of things to manipulate you. Because <laughs> children are excellent because they can feel your emotion and they're very good at working it out. So what they often will do, go, they'll go into this like... Uh, now, God, and boys and girls respond very differently, of course. You know, usually. A girl generally responds by doing the kind of thing you describe. Firstly, she says, Daddy, you're hurting me. So hurting me... I can't breathe. I'm can't gonna breathe. I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff, which often is a lot of crap, you know. Like, yeah. But it's just something to make you feel guilty. Right? So, so what does that tell you? You respond to the guilt of a woman. Mm. But I didn't, I didn't stop this time. I actually held her. So you held her. Still. And then she goes into... Limp. And what I, I call the limp phase. And I still held it. The limp phase is like, <laughs> the limp phase is if I go all limp and everything, <laughs> there's no resistance and, and, and eventually you'll let go, you know. So then there's usually the limp phase. And then after the limp phase... I still held it and then she cried. Okay. Many then go into rage yeah. and then they go into grief. Mm. Yeah. And it's the grief that's the healing part. You know, then you can let go of them and just hold them while they feel their grief. But when Laura restricted her, yes, Isha was wrapped. Isha loved it. Loved I'm, clo it. I'm close to mummy now. She's smothered in her and Laura's like, it's not working. She <laughs> loves it. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that tell? What does that tell you? That she wants to be close to her mum. Well, it tells her that she does generally does not feel loved by her mother, mm. doesn't it? Or she's in competition with me most of the time. Or she's in competition with her mother, with you, for mm. love. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so will she still hold her though if she's restricted? No, her? she gives it to you to, to restrict. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I get all the guilt stuff happening. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, so, see, if, if uh, one parent restricts the child after it's taken a violent action, which is unethical, Right, and the child loves the action that that parent is taking. Then you give the child to the other to the to the other parent, because it's obviously an issue with the other parent. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hand before mouth, darling. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> It would tell me a lot, though, about if I was that in that scenario, yeah. if I was Laura, I would go, oh, wow, you know, Isha doesn't feel this. She's, she's not Part feeling. of the reason why she might be hitting is that she's not feeling close to me. Exactly. Well, it's t talking about self-reflection yeah. again, isn't it? If the parent was self-reflective and all of a sudden they were loved, they were, they were held and they felt loved, then that, that tells you what they feel they're missing. 
So if the parent was self-reflected, they go, well, in my normal day-to-day life, obviously I feel competition with my daughter and that's why she comes up and hits me sometime for daddy's... And controls her and all yeah, that and all that kind of stuff, yeah. So, so when mummy holds me, I feel wonderful. That means that, you know, that's what she's missing. It tells you a lot. It tells the parent. This is why the parent has to be humble. Yeah, very important. You learn a lot through this process. By, by doing it in a tactile manner that's non-violent... You also learn a lot through the process because you have to be present as a parent to do that. Yeah. So it's wonderful. Yeah. Tara, thanks. Anyway. Um, in that action of holding them or correcting them, if the anger does start to come up for you though and, in, and you, you've moved from humility to, to being angry, mm-hmm. you then need to let them go. Is that right? Because if you, you can't keep restraining them if you're starting to feel that anger, which has happened to us with, with Noah. Yeah, you're now in an act of violence towards the yeah. child. So it's better to, it is more loving to then let them go and go and deal with... Yeah, you own. wouldn't like anger. So it's no. unethical to dump your anger on another person, yes. including your child. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So give it to the other parent. <laughs> <laughs> this is where if there's two parents, it's wonderful. Well, if you're a single parent, you can always enlist the help of a third party to involve in these kind of actions, um, unless, of course, there's no third party surrounding you at your home. But, but this is the trouble with single parent households is it's particularly difficult, more difficult, particularly if you've got lots of children, um, to engage in these particular, you know, rest- restricting the behaviour of the child in order to teach them. But, but it's still possible if you enlist the help of others. Yeah. Courtney, thanks. And the complications with that, I suppose, is you can't just ring someone up and get them to come over and half an hour passes and then <laughs> it becomes difficult because it has to be done in the, in the moment, doesn't it, to be effective? Yes, a lot of it needs to be done in the moment. However, don't, don't shy away from doing delayed action if you couldn't do it in the moment um, because the emotion is still present in the child. So, so you could actually, you know, for, for example, let's say you're at a shopping centre and the child engages in a certain amount of behaviour that, that is obviously unloving. So what you do is you grab the child, take it home. So you just stop your shopping and just say to the people, I'd like to leave my shopping here or whatever, and, uh, and, and take the child home. When you get home, you could then engage the restriction uh, in a place that's more comfortable for you, you don't feel as much, you know, problems. And you say to the child, it doesn't matter what their age, you say to the child, I'm doing this because one half an hour ago, you violently hit somebody. So this is why I've come home and I'm going to restrict you now. So you explain to the child, you connect the child with the action that they took and your response. That's all you need to do. It can happen a day later even. Uh, you could do it a day later, but it's best to do it within a few hours or within the next hour if you can because there is a connection of their behaviour with the action. That's what you're trying to achieve. So... I wouldn't. I, I, I would definitely, if the child was at, at a supermarket, I'd just pick up the child while it's screaming, take it out the door, shove it in its car seat, strap it up, take it home, and I'd perhaps just sit there with it in its car seat and explain to the child. And then I would, then when it's all done and it's finished crying, it might be two hours later, I then pick it out of its car seat, go back and try to pick up my shopping wherever I left that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Thanks. Mm. So a lot of times there are very practical things we can do, but we're just too afraid to carry them out a lot of times. Um, You know, we could do just a similar thing, simple thing if we're worried about the amount of racket the child's causing and the distress it's causing people around us. We just take it to the car seat, sit in the car, wind up all the windows with us inside, you know, a bit of air. We drive down the road into a parkland, we pull over and just sit in the car waiting for the child to finish it screaming in the car seat. You see, but to do that, you've got to be an engaged parent, don't you? You've got to be a parent who who loves their child and is willing to to break your... stop your daily activity just for the sake of teaching them something. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I didn't really want the microphone. It's a silly question. I refrain, but it's just, can you duct take him to a chair? (laughs) (laughs) Of course. It's just a, it's not a physical restraint. Like you're saying, the car seat, that's a restraint, but you're still with them in that moment. And, yeah, the, and of course it. there is going to be a lot more power 
if you actually are physically involved mm. in the restraint. The reason why is that there is usually something inside the parent that needs mm. to also be corrected under these circumstances and it would be wise for you to physically engage the actual action. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, when we disconnect ourselves as a parent from the physical action, in other words, we send them to their room or something like that, we are no longer as a parent really parenting. We're now, we're now disconnecting ourselves from the action that we're restricting them with and therefore there is a hi higher likelihood of them not learning any lesson from that restriction. And does that also distance ourselves emotionally so it limits ourselves from learning too from that? That's which why might be we our do it. problem. That's yeah. why we do it. We're angry or we're upset or whatever and we're avoiding our own stuff generally when we do things like that. The beauty of engaging it physically in a loving manner is that you have to now be present and involved. The other beautiful thing about that is because of your presence and involvement, you are now preventing any spirits from interfering with the process on the child. So there's a lot of advantages in you being presently engaged in the action. Right? It's just exactly the same actually when you're dealing with adults. It's a lot better to be physically and present in, in the action than it is to do something via Facebook or email. For obvious reasons. Like Facebook or email, you can't confront the emotions yourself, you can't feel what's going on, it's a delayed response. There's all sorts of problems with such interactions. It's far better if you can have a face-to-face -face interaction if it's possible because you get the full effect of the confrontation. Yeah? Which is very, very good. You had a question? Um, what if it's not uh, an act of like outright like violence, like a, a hit? Yeah. Um, what if it's more like a constant niggle, 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 push button, push button, until you finally get an eruption like... Uh, well, you need to look at my definition of violence, which I've given in the presentation I did recently on free will, because in that definition I call a little niggle like that an act of violence. Oh, okay. So, right. so my definition of violence is very wide and encompassing of a lot of emotional attitudes, not just physical violence. So, um, just look, not, these are not for our kids, but we're often babysit. Um, yep. Our great nephews, and yeah. you know, there's a bit of an age gap, seven year age gap. Yeah. So and one just niggles, niggles, pesters, pesters. The big pesters one the just pesters the little one, and 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 it doesn't happen that much at our place, but at home apparently it's all the time, and the parents are just don't know what's going on. Well, I can tell you what's going on. Oh. Um, it's quite obvious. The older child is jealous of the attention the younger child receives, right? And yeah. the older child feels less love than the younger child, yeah. and the older child is receiving less love than the younger child. So it's quite obvious that mum and dad have a different attitude towards their younger child than they do towards their older child. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So what What would you like? It, it occasionally happens with us, and I don't. So what I would do oh. is I'd talk to the older child, maybe even restrict its behaviour, but I would sit down with the older child and say, "You don't feel very loved, do you? Oh, and, you okay. and you don't feel. You obviously feel like the younger child takes away all the attention, and takes away." You know, that's how the older child is feeling. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You remember with an older child, generally, there is a period of time in their life where they receive the full attention of their parents. And then when the second child comes along, the older child doesn't receive the full attention. Now, if the full, of attention, the full attention of the parent of the, towards the older child is one of confusion, fear and violence, then, of course, the older child would like the shared attention. <laughs> right? In other words, they're receiving less confusion, fear and violence from the parents and so therefore they could probably enjoy that. But when the, older child, when the feeling coming towards the older child was one of love, acceptance and all of those kind of things and an, and a, and an engagement of time which is fairly, con fairly constant and particularly if, it's been, if there's quite a few years gap between the two children this occurs, then the older child learns that it should be the centre of somebody's attention. And then when the second child comes along there's a big confrontation with regard to the aspect of attention. Right, so the older child doesn't feel loved anymore. It doesn't mean that they're not being loved. It just means they don't feel as much love anymore. Right, and there's a reason why. There's got to be a reason why. Thank you. Yep. Well, my question doesn't go to this. To, does it go to this? It does go to the ethics, yeah. yeah uh, it's something that you mentioned. I thought, I'm not going to... I'm going to make sure this gets answered before... Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, you can mentioned... demand an answer if they say it. Well, no, no, it's... <laughs> no, no, just joking you, you. Left, you said something at the beginning of, da- of the day of yep. those who actually were interviewed. Ah, uh, yes. And you haven't said anything about it and I kind of I didn't like the idea. I was just about to. Good, thank you very much. <laughs> yep. Okay, because it's nearly time to finish, so I need to say something about it. Okay, so in this case we had an interviewer... And an interviewee, right? And what did the interviewer want from the interviewee? He wanted an interview. He wanted... Ah, yes. He wanted a signed agreement. Well, he requested that of all of you. Yeah. You, you didn't. Sign yeah. No, you, you didn't mention that to me. You got away with it. I didn't sign well, you then got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> but he actually requested a signed agreement from every person who had interviewed. Oh, okay. Even though they were on camera, yeah. they had to sign. Well, no, remember, he read out at the beginning. He yeah. said, anybody who doesn't want to um, be involved in this you know, process of being on camera or whatever, please let us know. And that indemnified him, right, against any claim that you would have made. If you didn't go up to him and say, then that's automatically accepted as acceptance. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand that. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, the reason why I say you engaged unethical behaviour is because you know what happened? He was unwilling to sign the same agreement. And if you were ethical with him, you would have asked, well, what if I want to use this material? However I want to use it, would you sign the same agreement? Now, this is something we raised with him after your interviews. And he was very, very upset with us after the interviews. And it is an issue we are going to raise with them. uh, And we did raise with them last, last night that why you are so upset with it when it was a requirement of the fact that we're engaging this process with you. It was a requirement that we are able to use material that might involve you. Right? Yes. So you will find in your dealings... You see, most people think of media. Oh, they go, oh, media. It's wonderful to be on the media, isn't it? Or whatever which is not true, but anyway, it's just like a feeling a lot of people have, which is a feeling of wanting some attention and wanting some approval and wanting some whatever, often which you don't get in that interaction. But, but there is also this sensation that we're willing to overlook moral and ethical love-based issues in interactions with people who are in positions of authority. Can you see that? Yeah. And as a result of that... We often allow behaviour from them that they would never engage in in us in in an equal way. We already put them above ourselves. So when these two people get together, the interviewer and interviewee, there's an automatic, usually, an automatic acceptance in the interviewee that the interviewer drives everything and the interviewer then becomes more important to the interviewee than the interviewee's own feelings are. And in that process, we abscond and we actually withdraw from an ethical interaction. Because what we're doing is we're saying, we're we're actually going, uh, we're actually more with withdraw from a moral interaction. Because we're actually saying that he deserves to be treated in a different manner, because he's the interviewer, than I deserve to be treated as the interviewee. And when he was confronted by myself and Mary that his face would be on, on, on in the internet, right? because he chose to want to interview us, his face would actually be on the internet, he wanted to not do the interview. And he was very, very angry and upset with us. And he was also angry, a bit angry with his producer because his producer never told him that that was our requirement. Which I understand him being upset with his producer, not so much with us. Right? The, but if you think about it, 
How ethical is that as a business? To actually expect other people to sign a disclaimer saying that you're going to use the material however you see fit, and yet you will not, as the interviewer or as the producer, sign the same disclaimer that the other person can use the material however they see fit. You see, if you were ethical, what would you do? You would treat the other person in exactly the same manner you would want them to treat you. So if you want to be treated as if you, everything's private, then you would never do, expect the other person to sign the agreement. But if you expect the other person to sign the agreement, then you would have to engage the fact that you might also need to agree to being used, your face or, or words being used in public. You would agree to one or the other, wouldn't you? Right? Would you not? So that's what you need to do in the, in the case. Avira. I know the question, but fire it away anyway. Sorry? Fire it I away anyway. I know what I'm asking. <laughs> um, he, he came and asked me during the break to yep. sign this agreement and I just asked him a whole lot of questions and I just felt this demand coming from him. I agree. Even though he kept saying, you don't have to, you don't have to, I, I felt this demand that he was. Yep. And I said, oh, look, I, I, I can't, I need to think about this. And then he came to me at the end and in, in the intervening time, I'd had this, oh, my God, I'm going into fear. I went into fear last year because I didn't want to be on YouTube and yeah, I'm doing yeah. it again. Yeah. I'll just sign the waiver when he, like he came charging at me at the end. Right. So I don't know now, have I done... Well, you don't need to worry about what you've done. You just need to worry about why. Do you understand? You don't need to worry about... Can I just say this to everybody? You don't need to worry about what you have done because you've already done it. So you, don't, you can't change it. So you don't need to worry about what you have done. You only need to worry about why. You only need to look at the emotional reasons inside of yourself that caused yourself to do what you did, that you might feel now is out of harmony with love of yourself or whatever. So what was the emotional reasons? That's all you need to look at. You don't need to punish yourself. And you don't need to say, oh, I did a terrible thing. You don't need to do any of those things. You just need to go... So where did I get it wrong? Like, I've obviously got something wrong. What was the emotion that you felt in that moment? When he comes up to you and he's very demanding and very pushy and he's very, and he, he's very insistent that he cannot interview you without... Oh, I didn't do an interview. It was just um, yeah. about being on camera. Yeah. But... Um, like I said, I got all confused because I didn't know should I be facing my fear now or should I be... Like, I felt his demand and I, I've, I got all conflicted. I didn't know... Yeah, now I'm still con I'm confused again. Well, I, I can only tell you what my feelings are. My feelings are this. I'm perfectly happy to sign his waiver. I read his waiver. It seemed pretty fair enough to me. He wants to use any of the material forever <laughs> at his own discretion and I have no claim upon it. And oh, that's fine. I don't want to have any claim upon it. That's fine. I want him to sign the same, sign the same agreement with me. That's my response. But I'm not in the position of caring about using his, his stuff. Well, if you're not in the position, then signing the agreement's fine. Except for one thing. Would he be willing to sign a similar agreement with you? It's not whether he does or has to, it's whether he's willing. Is there also the, the thing of the, the demand? like? And the demand is a part of, yeah. The, the, the demand in him, though, was a part of his fear that he would not get a story that he was si assigned to get. Yeah, because I amazing? thought, why would he care? Like, it's not about... Like, it just felt like a, a disproportionate amount of demand to the fact that... That's because he's in a lot of fear about not getting his story and, you know, all those kind of things. You know, there's this fear. It makes more work when he's got to enter somebody out. You know, he's concerned about a lot of different things. Yeah. If he can just go pan across the entire audience without having a blank out that face, blank out that face, blank out that face, you know, there's a lot of work involved in that. He doesn't want to do that work. So, that, you know, he's thinking about a lot of different things, which are all very selfishly motivated, I agree. Um, and it's up to you whether you pan to, to them or not, or, or, or when I say pan, whether you agree to them even or not. Now, I'm perfectly happy to agree. He can use my face, whatever my voice, whatever he wants, as far as he wants. I put all of my stuff on YouTube, as you know, all of these discussions on YouTube, for that reason, so that people can actually listen to the discussions and benefit from them. And in fact, my feelings are, anybody who does not want to be filmed in a 
sit in, in a circumstance where, that we have involved, then don't come to the presentation. Or don't put up your hand and ask a question. Because if you don't put up your hand and ask a question, there might be a general shot, but there won't be any face on you. Um, but my feelings are if you can engage that process, you'll benefit immensely from it. You'll deal with a lot of fear and you'll deal with grief and you'll deal with the, you know, your, your facts or, or your face being used in an unloving manner. And you'll deal with all of those things emotionally, which will be fantastic because all, all of those are fears that you can address. However, that doesn't change my requirement of him. My requirement of him now, from an ethical perspective, has to be his same requirement of me. Do you understand? So how did you resolve that with him? Like how was well, it's not resolved yet. It's not resolved yet. Um, the, what, what happened was we said we cannot go ahead with an interview. Um, he wanted to do an interview, as you saw, outside. Uh, some of you may saw. Um, and I said, I can't go ahead with an interview unless you agree to this. Right? And in the end, he said, well, what happens if I don't agree to it? I said, well, you won't get your interview. It's quite simple. I've, I've stated this to your producer. I have it in writing from your company that you're willing to do this. And on top of that, it's the same expectation that you have of me. <laughs> so how can I not be right? right? It's the same expectation you have of me. Right? And as a result of that, although he was upset, he still went ahead with the interview. Because he was concerned about not getting the story, you see. Now, we still have yet to fully address the issue. Because the reality is the amount of, dis uh, what would you call it, distress that he had and worry that he had about that is undoubtedly going to cause him later down the track to go, oh, I might sue them so that, because I haven't written it in writing myself that I've given them permission, I might decide to sue them. And so our response to this is going to be, myself and Mary cannot, cannot proceed any further with any interviews or any other things with this company until we have in writing now from this particular company and all of the people involved who come and, and interview us that we can use their material how we see fit as they originally agreed to in writing. And we won't be able to proceed aside from that. So that's the letter that we're writing to them at the moment. I started writing it this morning. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're doing that is because it's an ethical issue. It's an ethical issue. And, uh, and it's an issue based around love. When somebody expects of me what they will not deliver to me, then they are out of harmony with love. And I have the responsibility now, because I'm engaged with them, I have the responsibility to attempt to correct anything that's out of harmony with love. That's so I do. Does that make sense? So what happens in the situation in the situations of where we perceive other people to have power over us? Unfortunately, we automatically do not require the same ethical behavior from them as we require from ourselves, which is reversing the situation. We're actually allowing that person to treat us unethically. And if we loved ourselves, if we were moral, we would treat others and ourselves how God treat, wants all of his children to be treated. So in other words, we would treat other people not higher, not lower, but equal to ourselves. We would treat other people not with condescension, and not with, uh, like, there's a difference between honour and worship. So we wouldn't worship them, we would honour them, but we would not worship them. Right? And when we worship somebody, we allow them to, to treat us in a manner that we ourselves would not want to be treated. Or that they themselves would not want to be treated either, in a lot of cases. And that's different to honour. Like, I am perfectly happy to honour all of you, which I would like to do, actually, now, at the conclusion of our talk. Um, um, jo jo Joz, isn't jo it? Ellen. Jo Ellen. I would like to thank you for the hire of the venue, because you paid for the hire of the venue. Thank, thank you. So, 
No, that's okay. I'd like to thank you for it because it's just a lovely thing, gift that you gave to us to be able to hire the venue um, and to enable us to do these discussions over a period of two days. I'd like to thank all of you for your donations to us um, over the last two days as well. And I would love to thank all of our people who helped us, like with the videoing and the setup and the dismantle of everything as well. And I know there's quite a few regularly involved in that. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank them and honour them for their voluntary gift to you. Yeah. So we'd like to thank everyone for those. <laughs> All right, so hopefully in this discussion you've got now a little bit more of a concept of what ethics are and a little bit more of a concept of what morality is and also a little bit of a concept, even if you feel that you're not connected to God, um, a little bit of a concept of how you can determine what's loving and a concept of how you can determine what God would view as morality through analysing the history, if you like, of mankind. And my suggestion is if you can marry these two principles together and allow yourself to ponder about it and think about it in your day-to-day -day life, what will happen is you'll firstly start to become very ethical. You, you will start to treat others as you would like them to treat you and you will look at every area of your life where that is not happening. And that will help you become open to all of the unresolved emotions that cause us to decide to do unloving actions towards others. In addition, because of this ability we have to use our intellect, and remember I said yesterday, using our intellect is very important in analysing things. If we have this ability to intellectually analyse the history of mankind and determine the results of certain actions over a long period of time, the beauty of this analysis is that it enables us to see how pain tells us I mean the generalised pain of humanity, tells us what actions must be more in harmony with morality and what actions must be less in harmony with morality. And that then gives us all the ability, no matter what our development, it gives us all the ability to determine, firstly, how we can become more loving and, secondly, how we can become more ethical and moral. And I hope from our discussion today that you're able to see those two aspects together and then able over the coming few months to try putting these things into practice in your day-to-day -day life and in your analysis of what goes on in your day-to-day -day life because it will help you a lot to become a more loving individual and to notice the unloving behaviour and therefore notice what emotions must be driving these un the unloving behaviour that we have. So that's been the whole purpose of our discussion today so I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, we would, uh, we're, we're now, myself and Mary are now going home, um, back to Wilkesdale, and um, we'll be home for a period of around about three weeks or so, and then we leave on another trip, which at this stage is si Sydney for a couple of days, and across to Bathurst for a couple of days. The people in Bathurst are interested in setting up a learning centre in Bathurst, and so we want to talk to some of them over there about that. And then uh, on the way home, we go past home uh, via Kentucky and Armidale. And so we'll do one presentation there on the way home. And there is also a chance after that that we may finish up having to go to Brazil. Um, there's some people in Brazil who have uh, just not very long ago received all of the divine truth through all different sources. We've sent over six... Uh, discs full of information to them, six uh, hard disk drives. And uh, some of those people are now going from city to city doing presentations about um, divine truth, uh, which they wanted to do they, themselves. They've done it all on their own back and, and under their own steam. And uh, as a result of that, there's growing interest over there. So um, myself and Mary are thinking of uh, shortly trying to get over there if we can and uh, just you know, have some face-to-face -face time with those people who are doing that. So that's our plans for the next month or so. Um, and that's about as far ahead as we look. <laughs> uh, and we only look that far ahead because you've got to book flights and other things. <laughs> um, and we, 
but we'd like to just uh, encourage you to continue, if you wish to continue looking at uh, the, the website in terms of information that is still there. And we'd like to also encourage you to just continue trying to get closer to God and closer to love, even though at times you feel sometimes frustrated with yourself and sometimes upset and angry with yourself and sometimes afraid about how, where it's all going to take you. We, we would just love to encourage you to continue to do that because the happiness that comes from doing it in the long term will far outweigh this painful period that many of you are going through at, at this point in time. And we'd just like to encourage you to continue that process. Mary is still going to be doing her book groups, um, so they will be placed on the internet uh, every within usually a few days. Uh, Lena's managing to get them edited and placed on the on the internet. Um, so that will still happen with the with the Robert James Lee's books, and so there's quite a few. There's probably over a hundred and something chapters eventually in all of those books, and so that will probably be going on for. A, we're up to <laughs> chapter six. <laughs> So there's quite a few more weeks of that to go. Uh, and uh, yeah, Mary's not certain whether she will go into the second book or not. But, but you know, each book, each book has, a, has some wonderful material. So we're, we're also enjoying that process. Many people who have struggled in the past with understanding the divine truth and divine love path um, ha have actually found going through the book on a week-to-week -week basis something that's helped them understand some of the principles a bit better. And so that's a p very powerful mechanism of helping people as well. We're also hopeful if we do get a team together who to produce things over the coming months, we're hopeful that we'll put together a study, sort of a study group. And the first study group that um, Mary wanted to do was the process of repentance. True the true process of repentance, um, which involves... The first stage is addictions, <laughs> and probably I'm thinking after our discussion the other day, the first six <laughs> weeks would be on addiction. So the first six weeks would be about addictions, because while you stay in your addictions, you're never going to be sorry for what you do. Yeah, mm. that's right. followed by. A lot of time on fear. <laughs> so addictions involve uh, the aspect of anger as well and the, act, the aspect of depression and other things like that. Um, they're all part of that. So the next one was, babe? Uh, we'd be focusing on fear. Fear. And then third, probably on grief. On grief. And then the fourth, probably on signs. Yeah, the, the byproducts or the how you know you've really engaged repentance. Yeah. yeah. Of repentance. Yeah. Fairly predictable study material there. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretend, yes, yes. yeah. yeah so, um, so that material, what we're hoping to also do is uh, encourage, obviously, we've trying, been trying to encourage people to set up groups in every area, but we're concerned that the person who looks after the group understands the responsibility of the group. Because if you set up a group and run a group in a certain area, you need to understand your own responsibility to act in harmony with love and truth and in ethical behaviour um, and in harmony with morality. And so um, it's very, very important that any person who wants to set up a group in any location, and it's up, totally up to you, we don't, we don't assist you in any way aside from giving some occasional feedback um, or occasional feedback on what we hear. It's totally driven by the desires of the persons in the locations. Uh, we try to, though, give you a disc with all the material on it so that you can play talks or whatever um, and then discuss uh, information that you've received in the past. You see, a lot of people who come to it now are very, very new and they haven't heard a lot of the information. And so it's great to be able to get a lot of the older information and present that as in a, in a structured form and discuss it in a group. And there's groups all over the world now starting up doing that, um, which we want to support. But obviously we don't have the personal time to give those groups support. Um, as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of different things we're doing and uh, it's not e easy to give personal support. So what we're trying to do 
is eventually we're hoping to set up a group of people near us who are desiring to do those kind of things, give those kind of support to those kind of groups, uh, pr provide information to those groups and so forth. And eventually we hope that that will all be set up. Of course, that's all based on resources as well. And, and many of these people currently have jobs, so they can only do things in their spare time. Or the only other time we could do it is if we had enough money to pay some of them to... Or, or to at least give them enough money so they could live while they're doing the particular things they're doing for us. And at, that's, at this stage, that's not the case. So that's our, but that's our goals over the coming months. So we'd just like to mention those things to you. You wanted to mention something? Oh, just for anyone who does decide that they would like to hold a small group or something like that, uh, lead, lead a group, I suppose, I just wanted to mention that... Um, it's very um, – if you do it in an ethical manner yes. <laughs> and a moral manner uh, with a desire to be humble, that um, even if you start with something very basic from the teachings, it really tests how much you understand it at a soul level. Definitely. And for me, that's really powerful now, starting to do some things on my own teaching, yeah. um, just seeing where I'm really at in terms of my soul. And it's very powerful as well. As well, yes. So, yeah, it I can be a like very powerfully confronting experience, um, and you get all sorts of people in all sorts of conditions who come along. So, therefore, there could be very, very unloving things happen, and, and there's all sorts of things that potentially can happen. And as a result of that, there's also the potential for your growth through those interactions. So uh, that's why we like to encourage people to to do those kind of things. Of course. Um, when we say encourage, we're, we're talking about very loose encouragement because we don't want to try to push somebody into doing those kind of things. It has to be driven by the desire, by a sincere desire in the individual. So it's very important that, that the person who leads such a group is in an ethical space and, in a, and understands you know, God's principles of truth morally. Mind you... And um, to do that, it, it, it can be very simple. Like all, all you sometimes need to do is just play a half an hour of one of the talks I've given or something like that and then have a discussion. And whenever anybody in the discussion gets out of harmony with love, then you tell them. <laughs> you know? and, and if they are out of harmony with love and they get angry, then obviously they're out of harmony with ethics as well and you'd have to ask them to maybe leave until they can get themselves back into harmony with it. So there's a lovely learning process that can go on in these, in these experiences. Um, so we'd just like to encourage any of you to think about doing that. It's also helpful in a certain location to have a regular input of truth coming into your life. We know in a very busy life that it's sometimes very difficult to engage that every day. And having something that happens every week with a bit of homework or something like that is often a great way of trying to accomplish that. So, mm. Okay, um, is there any questions you'd like to ask before we finish tonight? Thanks. Anastasia, if we just mic you. Thanks. I was just wanting to know um, where I could find Mary's blog because I was oh, looking okay, for it. Okay, yes. All right, let's write that down. Um, I often don't know where to find it, so Mary will have to tell me. Because apparently you had um, mentioned that you're having the seminar here, but I only got the email two days before. So if I had access to Mary's blog, then I would have known. Yeah. You can access it via, you can access it via our site. Uh, if you where? go to About Mary, oh, is that where and then underneath there, I've got a list of things, and one of them is Mary's blog. Oh, is that uh, where it is? That's so how I Mary's blog at the first one that comes up. If you Google uh, my story... Oh. Um, um, blog um, you might find it's pretty high up on the list there as well um, so let's write it bigger so I'm pretty bad Magda we are both left handed at, at blogspot. But that's, that's all it needs, isn't it? Oh, is it at? <laughs> so it's no sign. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, we both left hander. Both khaki hand. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more khaki than Mary is. <laughs> is there any other questions you'd like to ask? I haven't updated the website uh, except for a very brief update that I just put in there a couple of days ago for about four months now, unfortunately. <laughs> um, my suggestion is, uh, is that I, I will get a chance over the next three or four weeks to update the website quite substantially, so it will change quite a lot. And I'm hoping in the future that we'll have regular updates happening to the God's Way of Love site, which will let you know what all the teams are doing and show you photographs of what they're doing. And there's all these things that the teams are doing, but unfortunately we don't get the chance to update the site as well as do them. <laughs> so at the moment we're doing a lot of doing and not much writing about what we're doing. Um, the uh, other thing that you need to probably know is, is that we on, on the YouTube, just search for the Divine Truth channel. And on the Divine Truth channel now we have, uh, which is run by Igor Shakanov, and Igor's handle on YouTube is called Wizard Shack, if you see that. Um, he, uh, he uploads all of the, uh, the DVDs, uh, all, the, all the videos that are produced, which he actually edits and produces as well. Um, he uploads them all as soon as he can do so on that site. And uh, if you look on that site, I think there's now probably three, two to three hundred gigabytes of data on that site now. Um, and his wife, Lena, does all of um, Mary's groups, book study group uploads as well onto the site. It's now, they're now being uploaded onto the site. So in the course of any one week or so, there's usually two to four hours of material getting uploaded onto the site. You can... We, you can actually download a downloader, you call a YouTube downloader, which enables you to, rather than watching it on YouTube, to actually use the link and download it to your computer so that it's permanently on your computer and you don't have to keep watching it on YouTube and using up your bandwidth. So what a lot of people are doing now is they're downloading the YouTube downloader and then they're downloading the link that they want to watch onto their computer and then storing it on a disk or something, a USB disk or something like that. And then you can watch it over and over and over and over again without using up more of your internet bandwidth. Has that been routine? Because I've attempted it. Yeah, no, I've yeah, done that many times. Yeah, yeah, it works. Yeah. There was, there was the YouTube. It's much better now. Um, yeah, it's called U. YouTube downloader and it's an actual program and you can also buy a professional version for about 20 bucks or something it is. So it, you can actually put together a long list of all the things you want to download and it downloads them all until you fit your in internet bandwidth. Um, yeah. No. No, the MP3s that are on the website are all audios, not videos. Oh, What's on YouTube is all videos. I get that, but with the audio, is it the same presentation? Yes, yes, uh, the audio is taken from the video, and it's the same, exactly the same presentation, and usually edited very much the same. Like we just cut, All we do when we edit is we cut off the beginning and the end that's just talking about you know arrangements or whatever, and the presentation itself is left unedited all the way through. Yep. Warts, can, and, warts and all. You can, you can download them as MP3 from that program as well. You can, no. yes. You can, if you want to. Yeah. You can convert the video into audio and download using this program as well. Yep. If, the, if, the vid, if the audio is not available. Uh, are we right? Yep. If, if I was interested in starting a group, yep. like... If I, w if I went there with those intentions, the thing is I'm not going to be able to do it all the time because I'm not loving enough yet. Yeah. But, like, if I did it wanting to do that, yep. is that all right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's the underlying desire. So, so my suggestion, if you feel like, oh, I'm not going to be able to be loving all the time, find somebody else 
who's willing to tell you, you're not being loving now, <laughs> and, and tell you why and actually give you good reasons why as to why you're not being ethical or treating others morally, and then just engage the process together, you know, in the, in the, in the process. I, I live in Geelong. I don't know where everyone else lives. It's sort yeah. of like very thrown apart. But, if anyone but Geelong's only an hour away from the city of Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Doing if it once anyone's a week. interested, could yeah. see me. Yeah. Yeah. And we'd be happy to send you a disc uh, of, of material as well, if you haven't got all the material. And one of the things we suggest is just play them, some of the material from an, old, from an old seminar or something like that for 15, 20 minutes, and then stop it where you think you want to stop it, and then get the group to discuss it. And facilitate it in a loving manner, you know, treat others as you want to be treated and, you know, treat others how God would like his children to be treated and yourself how God would like his children to be treated. Don't allow unloving behaviour on the part of people, but, but also be careful about what you judge to be unloving behaviour. That's, you know, that's you, the hard one. Yeah, yeah. So it's the best thing to do. The beauty of engaging the process is you'll always learn something, yeah, you'll always learn something. Yeah. Also, have a look at the attractions in the group. If you find you've got mostly women and no men, then you need to talk about... The women all need to talk about some of their attitudes towards men. Does that make sense? If you've got mostly old people and no young people, then everybody there needs to talk about their attitude towards young people. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because uh, the law of attraction should be such that there should be a lovely mix of people coming to a group. So, so now up in uh, Kingaroy, when we do groups in Kingaroy, um, usually there's a long, large range of people from young children up to o older persons, a lot, like a fa very even number of people gender-wise in terms of male and female. And uh, that's a good indication that the group is slowly working through some issues. And also it's about myself and Mary's openness as well, working through <coughs> issues. If you find a group is... Um, dominantly masculine or dominantly female, then you need to have a look at what the dominant attitude is towards the opposite gender. So just allow yourselves to deal with that as a part of the exercise. Yeah. Okay, no other questions? So we can all go home. You ripper. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.